All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining tonight. Uh, it's five o'clock and we're going to get started. So a couple of housekeeping items uh, to begin with uh, before we jump right in. Uh, if you have questions throughout the talk, uh, please use the Q&A feature, that Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window uh, to enter any questions throughout the talk. Uh, my colleague, Carrie Jedlika, who's on the Zoom with us, will be um, helping to facilitate that uh, at the end uh, with Dr. Parikh. Uh, also, the session's being recorded, so uh, we'll you know, compress this and, and get it up on YouTube and send the link out with you all here today and the, the folks that uh, registered but weren't able to attend. Probably later this week, we'll be able to get the link out to everybody, um, so you'll be able to kind of have it for later viewing. Uh, we're excited to have Dr. Chiti Parikh with us this evening. A little bit about her. Uh, she's an assistant professor and she plays an active role in medical education, research, and patient care. As a board certified internist and diplomat of the American Board of Integrative and Holistic Medicine, she has co founded the Integrative Health and Wellbeing Program at New York Presbyterian in Weill Cornell. This program provides integrative modalities such as acupuncture, meditation, yoga, nutrition guided imagery, Reiki, and functional medicine to patients and staff. She'll be speaking to us tonight about the role of medical marijuana in an integrative approach to cancer treatment symptom management. Dr. Parikh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. So today's topic um, is often controversial. Uh, but I hope to shed some light on um, the nuances, the logistics, and the actual facts about medical marijuana and how it can be used. It is something that I feel like it's underutilized. I'm hoping shedding more light on it and educating providers and patients, we can hopefully add it to our toolbox. So when we talk about medical marijuana, the first thing uh, I just want to clarify is the terminology, as in you know, there's a lot of terms that people hear when it comes to marijuana. Is it cannabis? Is this hemp? Um, uh, what is CBD? What is THC? So cannabis is a plant family that includes many uh, species, including hemp and marijuana being the two main ones. So hemp plant is actually legal to grow and it's used for many commercial um, aspects. So the hemp fibers are very strong. So they're used in building things like ropes. Uh, my winter jacket's actually made out of hemp plant. Uh, even hemp seeds are used as a common source of protein and uh, you find that those in health food stores. So hemp plant is legal. Um, anyone can grow it often used for industrial purposes. The reason why hemp plant is legal is because the levels of THC, which is the psychoactive substance, um, is found in percentages uh, much less than what the government requires. So usually it's less than 0.03% of the plant's chemical makeup is uh, less than that of THC. Uh, versus marijuana, on the other hand, has a lot more THC, the psychoactive substance, compared to CBD. So many marijuana plants can have anywhere from 20 to 40% of the chemical makeup as THC. Hence, that is classified as Schedule One drug in the United States. Um, so that's the difference between hemp and marijuana. And some of the things you might hear, you know, there's a lot of health food stores nowadays saying there's CBD creams, there's CBD um, uh, tinctures you can add, CBD capsules, CBD in your coffee and chocolate and whatever, right? So that CBD that's available very freely on the market comes from the hemp plant, hence it's legal. So the CBD that comes from marijuana um, often comes with a higher amount of THC that's legally allowed. So whatever you see on the market is legal because that CBD is coming from the hemp plant. So the three main chemical compounds that we see in the marijuana plant that tend to have more medicinal uh, properties, the first one is CBD. Um, and that part, like I said, is not psychoactive. The CBD does not make you high or make you drowsy or anything like that. It has more of an anti-inflammatory property. And there's many different types of cannabinoids that can be found in the cannabis plant, and they're being studied actively for different types of therapeutic uh, implications. The THC is the primary psychoactive component that binds to something called cannabinoid receptors in the brain and has its psychoactive properties. And it often helps a lot with pain management uh, because the cannabinoid receptors are very active in the brain that modulate sensation of pain. 
There's other molecules like terpenes that are often what uh, gives a medical a marijuana plant its uh, classic aroma, the smell or the taste. Um, and these terpenes are also investigated uh, for their variety of health benefits. So as a reminder, so marijuana is still a Schedule I drug, same as heroin um, as per federal government. It's not recognized for medicinal use, but different states, as you know, have different rules around it. So honestly, I feel like the, because of its Schedule I drug um, allocation, same as you know, PCP or LSD or heroin, unfortunately, it hasn't been that easy to do research in marijuana uh, regarding marijuana. But I'm hoping that over the next few years, a lot of the regulations will change, hopefully allowing marijuana to be downgraded to Schedule II drugs so more research can be done um, along, uh, especially nowadays, because we're looking at it as a good option for pain management compared to the opioids they have, we have been using. So the sentiment for marijuana has changed drastically, and this is the updated list as of last year. And as you can tell, majority of the states have some sort of a, a marijuana law by the state. A lot of them in the dark green, as you can see, allow marijuana use for recreational and med medical purposes. Um, and in the lighter shades, you can see some have combination of CBD, TC allowances, some have only medical uses provision, and some have no programs. But as you can tell, this is changing very quickly. In other countries, just like Canada, even legalize ma marijuana use for recreational and medical use. So I expect this map to constantly evolve and change over the next uh, few months to years. So keep an eye out for the regulations. Um, so the, what are some of the most common reasons why medical marijuana is often recommended or prescribed or used, the number one reason often tends to be for chronic pain, followed by neuropathies and for cancer-related symptoms. So when it comes to neuropathy, sometimes neuropathies can be hard to treat. And the few drugs we have sometimes don't give the full relief, so patients often use medical marijuana as an adjunct therapy. Same thing for chronic pain and some of the cancer-related symptoms, uh, whether it's pain or chemotherapy-related nausea, fatigue, lack of appetite, weight loss, all of those reasons it can be used for. Uh, and most people think that the, the attitude towards medical marijuana is far more lax in younger patients, but that's not necessarily true. More than 45, uh, almost 50% of the patients who are certified for medical marijuana tend to be of age 50 and above. So I don't think age or attitude is necessarily a barrier um, when it comes to accepting medical marijuana as a therapy. Um, and out of many patients who are certified for medical marijuana, about 5% of them are designated as terminally ill. And again, it's used for symptom management in those patients. Um, there's over 12,000 caregivers also registered for this program. So when a patient registers for this program, we'll talk more about the details. Um, if the patient themselves is too sick to be able to um, you know, speak with the pharmacist or go to the dispensary, they can always designate a, a family member um, to be registered so they have access to um, you know, being able to pick up the prescription for them and things like that. So as of, you know, in January 2019, last year when I gave this talk, there were about 2,100 practitioners, and these can be physicians, MDs, or these can be nurse practitioners or physician assistants who are uh, registered in the New York State as medical marijuana prescribers. And at that last year, there were about 80,000 patients who are registered for the program under New York State. The law was passed in about 2014. And the medical marijuana program actually came about in about 2016. So just in the last four years, the program has developed very quickly. And as of early this September, there were almost 3,000 registered practitioners and over 124,000 certified patients in, in, across the state. So what is the sort of the logistics of doing this? So a lot of patients have questions about, you know, what happens when I'm prescribed medical marijuana? Um, do I have to smoke it? Do I have to uh, go buy it from somewhere? Can I pick it up at CVS? So there's a lot of questions around it. So I'll first start from the practitioner side. So when you, um, if you're an MD, PA, or an NP, if you're interested in being certified for the medical marijuana program, the physician, the NP, or the PA have to take an online course, um, which is about four hours long. And once they 
take the uh, allocated training, then they can register on Department of Health's website, and then they can access the account to be able to certify patients. From the patient's perspective, if you are interested in medical marijuana, uh, exploring medical marijuana as a therapy, um, you can uh, go to the New York State Medical Marijuana Program's website, and they have a registry where you can find a physician and P or PA in your area that you can reach out to discuss medical marijuana as a therapy option. So once you see the physician um, or the, any provider uh, who's certified to be able to give you medical marijuana license, then you speak with them, you have a consultation with them. Due to COVID, some of the rules have been changed that where you can do an online consultation through telemedicine visits, doesn't have to be in person. Uh, and once the physician deems that you do meet the criterion that you will benefit and is safe for you, then they'll certify you online. Once you're certified online, then you just have to do your part in registering online, which takes about five to 10 minutes. The registration is on New York State's website. They just want to make sure that you actually live in New York State, so they might ask you for a New York State driver's license or a picture of a utility bill or something like that. Because as you know, every state has their own regulations. So what we're talking about today just applies to New York State residents and New York State providers. Once you register online and your application goes through, usually uh, within 24 hours, then the, uh, you can print out a temporary medical marijuana card. It will also mail you an actual card uh, in the mail so you can carry the card with you in case you are traveling, in case you have medical marijuana products on you, just to show that you are certified to carry that and use it. And once you get the card and once you get the temporary you know, certification, you can actually call the medical uh, marijuana dispensaries. There are several dispensaries. You don't go to CVS or Rite Aid. Uh, you go to these certified medical marijuana dispensaries. They're very tightly monitored, regulated by the state. And you can speak with the pharmacist there. So a lot of my patients, I encourage them to do a virtual visit or a phone uh, consultation with the pharmacist at the dispensary to discuss your symptoms, the other medications you might be taking. They're extremely knowledgeable. So they can help you uh, figure out what dose might be, it might be best to start, or the physician or the provider certifying you can recommend certain dosing uh, prescriptions. So that's sort of the logistics of how to get certified, and what the process looks like. It's actually not that bad. It really, um, you can basically finish the whole process within 24 hours um, if you like. So these are the uh, indications that are currently approved in New York State for uh, the symptoms and diseases you might, cert you might you know, qualify to get medical marijuana. So on the left um, are all the diagnoses and conditions such as cancer, multiple sclerosis, chronic pain, neuropathy, inflammatory bowel disease such as Crohn's ulcerative colitis, also PTSD. So these are the, the indications. And if you meet any of these diagnoses, and you also meet the condition on the right, whether you have associated severe pain, nausea, muscle spasms, or weight loss or wasting, um, then you qualify for medical marijuana. Again, every state has different um, sort of guidelines and indications, but all, these, are, these tend to be relatively common. There might be a few additional added on in different states. These tend to be the most common ones. So once again, if you feel like you qualify for any of these conditions um, and you meet the criteria, then I encourage you to go to the medical marijuana website on New York State um, D Department of Health website. And you can go through the registry, find a practitioner. If you are a patient here at Wall Cornell, New York Presbyterian, uh, our practice at Integrative Health, we have five physicians who can certify patients. Um, and there's other physicians in other departments such as pain management and neurology who can also do that or you can find a practitioner close to you. So once you do that, you obtain the certification from the provider, you register online, you get your ID, and then you go to the dispensary to pick up the product. So a typical dispensary, you know, nowadays everything is virtual, so you don't have to physically go in. A lot of the medical dispensaries will actually uh, do home deliveries in New York State, so uh, that's also an option. So again, that is not a barrier to get this type of care. So you can do a virtual consultation with a physician, you can do a virtual consultation or phone consultation with the pharmacist, and they can always deliver the product to you. Um, so when prescribing medical marijuana, there are two things that we look at. 
First is the formulation. So to keep it simple, the way the medical marijuana is prescribed is uh, dependent on whether we're looking at the THC or the CBD. So it comes in different combinations. So the high THC, low CBD combination is often used to treat severe pain, nausea, vomiting. Uh, it's also used to stimulate appetite and help people gain uh, appetite and some weight and also helpful in difficulty sleeping. But again, that is a psychoactive substance. So it's typically uh, used at night um, to help with sleep or pain. Now for severe pain, it can be used anytime during the day. But if you are using high THC combinations, of course, you want to be careful. You don't want to drive. You don't want to operate heavy machine, machinery. Um, some patients, they might be okay with equal THC, CBD. So it's 50% CBD, 50% THC. This is often used for moderate pain and also for neuropathic type of pain, for anxiety. It's also used for, uh, for inflammatory conditions and muscle spasms. Whereas the high CBD is commonly used for neuropathic pain, anxiety, inflammation, muscle spasms. And again, similar indications with the high CBD, the low THC doesn't affect your cognition. So I have patients who use the high CBD formulation and they're able to work, or they're able to carry on their normal routine. So these are the, so when I prescribe it, or when the pharmacists will be talking to you, they'll be looking at which of these combinations might work best for you and you can mix and match. For some patients, I'll recommend the high CBD during the day and maybe equal THC CBD at night or the high THC at night to help them with more severe pain or sleep. So you can combine it in different ways and get uh, the relief or the symptom relief that you're really looking for. And the second thing we look at is how do we administer medical marijuana? So you don't have to roll a joint, you don't have to smoke it or anything like that. Luckily in New York State, medical marijuana is prescribed in forms that are very easy to take. So it can come in capsules or tablets. It can come in tinctures, so you can put it under your tongue. Um, it also comes in a vape pen. Um, so, and it, now also it comes in a topical formulation, so you can use it as a cream. It's really helpful for musculoskeletal type of pain. So, we pick which type of formulation will be best depending on the symptoms, the severity of the symptoms, um, and how often do they come up. So the difference between a capsule versus a tincture or a vape pen is how quickly it takes effect in your body and how long does it last. So vaporization pen, the vape pen, is typically used for very severe pain where you really want quick relief. Because it's inhaled, it gets absorbed through the lungs into your blood very quickly, so it has an effect within half an hour or sometimes even within 10 or 20 minutes. So for severe pain, the vaporization pen can be really helpful. It's also helpful for patients who have severe nausea or severe oral ulcers or something where they're not able to really do the oral capsules or oral tinctures. For those patients, the vaporization pen, I typically use it for severe pain. Um, can be helpful. Kicks in really fast, but it only lasts for maybe 30 minutes to an hour. So it's not ideal to keep using it all day long. It's really good for breakthrough pain or for some severe episodes of pain. So it's used for episodic use. The sublingual tincture, on the other hand, goes underneath your tongue and that kicks in within 30 minutes to an hour and the effect lasts typically three to four hours. Um, and for the capsules and the tablets, the effect comes on in about an hour and can last six to eight hours. So if someone is suffering from chronic pain, the pain from say uh, spinal stenosis or, um, or some uh, like osteoarthritis that is always chronic, that's always present, then uh, the capsules or tablets are pref uh, preferred because then you don't have to keep taking it. You can take it twice a day and get pretty much consistent pain relief throughout the day. And then if needed, you can always use the tincture of the vape pen. So this is how we make the determination uh, of whether to do the capsules, um, the sublingual oil, or vape pen. So, and the pharmacist is really good at kind of guiding you through that. Our, you know, most, um, most people will often start out, I personally like to start out patients on sublingual tincture because it gives them a good feel of how they'll feel. Um, it gives them a little bit of relief, but not too long in case they have any side effects. And then once they figure out a dose and a formulation that works for them, then they can transition to a capsule or tablet for more long lasting relief. 
So there are many companies, uh, many dispensaries in New York City, uh, and they all have their own product. Again, this is all very regulated by the state. Um, so the typical product variation will be in percentage of THC or CBD. Typically, every company has their own version of high THC, 50-50, the THC equals CBD or the high CBD form. So um, some, some of them use a formulation that's 20 to one ratio. Some of them use a five to one ratio or two to one ratio. So there's a lot of flexibility in formulations. So these are the top five dispensaries, I would say, um, that uh, most of my patients end up using. So until recently, not many uh, national physician organization, health organization had really good guidelines. We really lacked good guidance as to how to start people on what dose and how to monitor patients. Fortunately, this uh, actually in last week, there was an international pain management conference called Pain Week. And they actually um, came up with a task force with physicians across the world to come up with some guidance around do dosing of medical marijuana. What they recommend is starting with CBD, uh, perhaps five milligrams of CBD twice daily, and then slowly increase the dose of CBD until you reach about 40, and then slowly starting with a little bit of THC and going up on the THC. So it's a nice way to kind of work your way up. For patients who were really worried about um, you know, side effects from the high THC, they suggest using lower doses of THCs to start with and titrate slowly. And again, for patients with more severe pain, uh, more acute conditions, we don't have to do a slow uh, increase. We can actually start with an equal CBD THC combination and increase the dose a little bit more rapidly for more rapid symptom relief. So these are just guidelines, but again, every, every patient, every symptom is different. So that's why you should really work with your provider and the pharmacist at the dispensary to figure out what formulation is best for you. And some of the side effects, contraindications, interactions you have to worry about. Generally, medical marijuana is safer compared to something like opioids. Uh, some of the common side effects uh, tend to be dizziness. Um, for high THC formulations, people can have some uh, bad dreams, um, some psychotic episodes. Again, these are very, very rare. Um, more common ones tend to be sedation. Uh, for people with low blood pressure, it can lower the blood pressure a little bit, so you want to be careful. Uh, sometimes it can cause a bit of palpitations if you take too much. But again, there's not a significant, you know, compared to opioids when people can die from overdose, that's not necessarily the case with medical marijuana. Again, I'm only talking about medical marijuana, not recreational marijuana. So the medical marijuana, the dosing, the risk of overdose is extremely rare and it's not deadly. Um, if anything, you'll just fall asleep, but it doesn't stop your breathing or anything like that compared to opioids, which they can. Um, the few times where we would not prescribe medical marijuana, of course, if you don't meet those criteria, but also if you have an active psychological disorder or if you have active substance abuse um, uh, history, those are the reasons why we would not actually prescribe it. And if you are on certain medications, um, such as blood thinners like Coumadin, um, Theophylline, which is often used for severe asthma, Clobazamine that's used for seizures, same thing Valproate um, and alcohol, so there, there is some interactions with medications because these all use the same enzymes in the liver, so you want to be careful. Um, especially with blood thinners, it's not an absolute contraindication, but it can affect your blood thinning number called the INR. So if you are starting medical marijuana, it has to be observed very, very closely. And if you change the dose of the medical marijuana, then you also require, need to monitor the warfarin dosing as well. So again, these are the indications, uh, so contraindications, interactions you want to be mindful of. So that's what I had to offer for medical marijuana. But one other thing, you know, I, I want to spend in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes talking about the more holistic approach to symptom management, especially patients going through cancer treatment. So medical marijuana, like I mentioned, is one of the tools in the toolbox, but there are many other things that we can do. So the field of integrative medicine, uh, people often think about it as a new field of medicine. What I want, to, uh, I often refer to integrative medicine is as the original way of medicine, how it was supposed to be practiced. So integrative medicine, in, in, you know, really looks at the whole person uh, rather than just a condition or an organ or a disease. So 
it really encompasses the mind body components of it also taking into account uh, social um, spiritual you know, environmental factors that play a role in health and disease so you might have you know thought about integrative medicine in different terms. A lot of people might have heard of the term alternative medicine, complementary medicine, or integrative medicine. There are significant, you know, there are very important differences between these terminologies. So let's say if I was diagnosed with high blood pressure and I decided to not take medications for high blood pressure. Instead, I decided to uh, try some herbs or supplements if I do that, that's alternative because it's an alternative to conventional medicine. If I got diagnosed with high blood pressure and let's say instead of taking, uh, you know, I decided to take the medication prescribed by my doctor, but I also decided to work with a fitness uh, instructor and start focusing on perhaps losing weight or exercising. But the right hand is not talking to the left hand. The doctor is prescribing the medication is not necessarily counseling you on the exercise or diet. In integrative medicine, we really combine all of the evidence-based therapies into one. So if someone comes in with a diagnosis of high blood pressure, they might leave with a prescription of a medication, but they also leave with recommendations for how to change their diet, how to manage their stress, how to focus on exercise, because all of those things in research have shown to be helpful for high blood pressure. So again, this is a more integrated model where you're combining the best of all different types of modalities that are proven in research to be very helpful. So that's how we define integrated medicine. It's bringing together a conventional and complementary approaches in a coordinated way. So the differences between integrative medicine um, and sort of conventional medicine is it's the emphasis is really on personalized evidence-based care. Like I mentioned, you know, people always ask me as an integrative medicine physician, what do I treat? You know, I don't treat diabetes, I don't treat cancer, I don't treat pain, I treat people, right? So two people can walk into my office uh, with the same exact diagnoses but my approach to the treatment will be very different between these two patients because it depends on what their physical symptoms are, psychological background, social, spiritual, environmental influences on health. And when you take all of that into account, you can really create a personalized treatment plan. And the focus for integrative medicine is always trying to get to the root cause and prevent things rather than a more reactionary approach is just putting a band-aid on the symptoms. And there's significant emphasis on quality of life because that, you know, it's not just about increasing uh, living an extra day or bringing down the blood pressure 10 extra points. The focus is on how can we do that to optimize the quality of life as well. And no one person can do this. It's really a team-based approach. To, um, you know, you combine physician visits with a nutritionist visit or with a psychologist or a meditation instructor. So all of this is done under one roof. And a focus always comes back to diet and lifestyle changes because those are fundamental to anything when we talk about health or diseases. Integrative medicine is a growing trend. More than 40% of patients, you know, use some sort of integrative medicine, whether it's uh, different types of diets or meditation, yoga, acupuncture. Uh, and the reason why more and more of these treatments are becoming more mainstream now is because of research. So in the last uh, two decades, there's a lot of research that have come out in support of these complementary modalities. And one of the main reasons is the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. This body, um, it makes up one of the 27 uh, units of National Institute of Health, the NIH. And this is one of the lead agencies within the NIH. It, it uh, started in um, 1998 when it started out with the funding of $2 million. And in uh, just last couple of years, their funding has gone up to about $150 million a year. So all of that, um, you know, those resources are going towards researching things like mind-body practice, such as medica uh, meditation, acupuncture, tai chi, yoga, and also looking at herbs and botanicals and dietary supplements, different types of diets, and how they can impact uh, different conditions, uh, such as pain, such as anxiety, um, even help uh, mitigate side effects from other medications or treatments, especially in cancer. So we expect to see more and more research to come out um, as the years go by in support of some of these complementary uh, modalities. 
So some of the mo most common reasons why patients would uh, go for a more integrated approach, the com most common reason often tends to be chronic pain, because as we know, chronic pain can be challenging to treat. And right now, one of the most common things we use for pain is uh, things like opioids, which we know have a lot of side effects and significant addiction potential. So chronic pain tends to be one of the sort of the strengths of integrative medicine because it really approaches it more holistically. GI disorders are very common. Mental health, such as anxiety, depression, stress, PTSD, cancer symptoms, and again, stress. So any, and people come in for all of these, right? So often someone with GI issues like IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, might also have associated anxiety right, or might uh, worsen the GI symptoms because of stress, right? So there's a lot of overlap between these conditions. They often go hand in hand, and that's why addressing it more holistically gives you um, a more rewarding experience because you're not looking at these conditions in isolation, really addressing the root cause. So let me take the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about the integrative medicine program here at Ball Cornell and New York Presbyterian. So the objective of the program, which started about four years ago, is really to create an individualized healthcare system that combines the conventional along with evidence-based integrated medical treatments to promote physical, psychological, and spiritual well-being. So we offer many of these services, such as physician consultations, but also nutrition, psychotherapy, meditation, yoga, massage, Reiki, and the list is ever expanding. Um, so people always ask me the question, how is integrative medicine different from the primary care? Uh, at the Integrative Medicine Center, we don't practice primary care. We often work very closely with the primary care doctors and other providers, such as your oncologists, such as your pain management specialists, neurologists. We really develop a team around, uh, around you. So the main difference is that we often dedicate much longer visit times. So an average consultation with a new patient for me typically lasts about 60 minutes. And during that time, we talk not just about the medical history, the surgical history and things like that, but we also talk a lot about you know, diet, lifestyle, stress levels, sleep, exercise, social support, because we know all of those are extremely important when we come with a treatment plan. And that's what helps us recommend a personalized treatment plan. And again, this might involve not just the physician, but also working with our nutritionist, our fitness instructor, um, meditation instructor, and all of the visits, whether you see a massage therapist or a physician, everything is in your chart. So if you have an oncologist at Cornell, they'll be able to see everything that's happening at the Integrative Health Center. And we often use technology to our advantage. Uh, and even before COVID, we really embraced the idea of telemedicine because we know how hard it can be for patients to get to so many appointments. It can be very stressful. So we wanted to make sure that we leverage technology to make sure we manage a continuity of care and support our patients on an ongoing basis so that they can make changes to diet and lifestyle in a more sustainable manner. And again, it's always about bringing evidence-based modalities, keeping an open mind, bringing a, some of these cutting edge uh, therapies into practice. Um, so currently we have a large team and ever expanding team. We currently have five physicians um, uh, and they all specialize in something slightly different. I'm, um, you know, I'm, I trained at Cornell in inter uh, internal medicine and also integrative medicine. Uh, whereas Dr. Cohen it comes from a family medicine background. Dr. Loy comes from, a, she's a pediatrician, but also trained in integrative medicine. Um, and uh, Dr. Malvihel, Dr. Abdullah are our fellows this year who joined us. Um, we also have a nutritionist, clinical psychologist, our meditation instructor who runs our mindfulness program. We also have three licensed acupuncturists who come with extensive experience. Um, Dr. You know, Dr. Fabrican, who has his PhD in uh, acupuncture, actually did a two-year fellowship at Beth Israel Hospital in their oncology center. Um, and Irina uh, Rimmel has worked extensively with chronic pain patients, with patients struggling with HIV, and looking at how acupuncture can help them. And Yvette, who was a surgical technician before at Cornell, um, he, she's also a massage therapist and a licensed acupuncturist, and she brings the concept of the mind-body medicine really into practice. And she also runs our Reiki training program. She's a Reiki master herself. And we uh, actually, a new uh, massage therapist just joined our team. So she'll be seeing, uh, seeing patients starting next week. 
So all the services we offer, pretty much most of them, like physician consultation, psychotherapy, nutrition, acupuncture, mind-body instruction, hypnotherapy, a lot of that, uh, we do uh, accept insurance for that. And again, coverage varies from insurance to insurance. Massage therapist is out, uh, is out of pocket. A lot of our patients use their flexible spending account to pay for it. That's an, always an option. But a lot of the other therapies, we really try to accept and cover under insurance as much as possible. Um, we currently offer several virtual shared medical appointments. So these are conducted through Zoom in a group setting, and they focus on topics such as stress management, chronic pain, uh, biofeedback, nutrition topics. Uh, we also have a free online meditation that goes every day at noon, um, offered by uh, Emily Hersline, which is completely free. And I'll, I'll show you on our website where you can get a link for that. She also runs an eight-week mindfulness-based stress reduction program, which is very much um, proven in research to help a lot with chronic pain, anxiety, depression. We also have a Reiki training program for patients and caregivers, and even a lot of our nurses get trained in Reiki. Um, that's actually, we have a training coming up tomorrow, actually. And we also offer group medical acupuncture. So for patients who don't have acupuncture coverage through insurance, uh, we use a group medical acupuncture model where a physician like myself who is trained in acupuncture will work with the licensed acupuncturist to offer these visits. These are uh, considered medical visits. So you basically pay your copay, but you are able to get acupuncture either through a physician or through a licensed acupuncturist. So that's always an option. So our goal is to really get as many of these therapies to as many patients and not let you know, insurance or cost be a barrier. Um, and our website has a ton of resources. Let me see if I can give you a little tour of our website. So if you go to our main website, um, there is a link called uh, Wellbeing Videos and Audios. And there we have several meditation and yoga videos. Oops. There you go. Okay. So on our website, there is a lot of different options. If you click on it, there are options to click on free audio uh, for meditation. There's videos for meditation and yoga as well. And there is a long list of events um, there as well that you can access. So feel free to navigate to our website. Um, and then since we cannot do this in person, I figured I'll give you a virtual tour before we end our talk and I open it up to questions. So our center is located on 69th and York Avenue. It's part of the new DHK building, some of you might be familiar with, and it has its own separate entrance to 69th Street. This is our first floor lobby. And again, we spent a lot of time with the architect in designing the space to make sure that it didn't look like a typical doctor's office that it really looks like a space uh, for healing and for sort of comfort. This is our typical acupuncture room. Um, so we have seven different acupuncture rooms. Um, and in the middle, we have a little meditation sanctuary that patients can use before or after treatment. Um, we also have large multi-purpose room. Unfortunately, right now it's on hold, but we conduct a lot of yoga, Pilates, and Tai Chi classes there. And on our second floor education room, we conduct a lot of nutrition talks um, and seminars there. Um, and this is a third floor. That's where a lot of our doctor, you know, office visits and acupuncture visits are conducted. So that's a little virtual tour of our center, a little introduction about what we do, and also a quick uh, wrap up of uh, what medical marijuana has to offer to our patients and what the practitioners can do for many different conditions. So I hope this was helpful. I want to make sure we have enough time for questions. So I'll end here and I will open it up to questions. Dr. Parikh, thank you so much for this informative talk. Um, anyone who has questions, please feel free to put them in the chat um, below, um, or you can use the Q&A. Um, don't be shy. <laughs> Um, while we wait, I just want to mention a couple of things, a couple of common questions that I get that I forgot to mention um, is medical marijuana, unfortunately, is not covered by insurance. So it is an out-of-pocket cost. Depending on which formulation you're using, what the dose is, it can cost anywhere from maybe you know, $40, $50 a month to maybe $200 a month, depending on how much you're using. Um, so it does vary a lot. 
Um, and a lot of my patients ask me questions about edibles. Uh, in New York State, medical marijuana is not available in an edible form, uh, like a cookie or a gummy that might be available in other states. Um, so currently in New York State, it's really allowed for in a tablet form, capsule form, the sublingual tincture I mentioned, the vaping pen, or topical applications. Um, so those are the things you want to watch out for. And I really make a big distinction between recreational medical, uh, marijuana use and medical marijuana use, very, very different things. Right. So when we talk about recreational use, if you buy something uh, from California or Massachusetts where it's allowed for recreational use, you often have no idea how much CBD or THC is really in it. So for if you're really using it for medical purposes, then that is not the way you want to go because you just don't know what you're getting. There's no consistency in dosing. So um, so I would not recommend that. All right, that's a great point. Very important to mention. Um, well, we will leave the chat open for a couple more minutes if anyone has any last minute questions. And I'll just highlight one thing. If you are interested in seeing any one of our providers, feel free to go on our website. Um, you know, you can be just type in New York Presbyterian Integrative Health. Our website will come up. And from there, you can call us, you can email us, you can email us at integrativehealth at med.cornell.edu. If you have any questions about getting an appointment or any services we offer, uh, feel free to message us uh, or call us anytime. Okay. I see we have a question in the chat from Evelyn. Um, can patients qualify, um, do MM based on diagnosis alone or do they have to have specific symptoms as well? Good question. Yeah, so typically the, the list of diagnoses I mentioned on the left. So if you have any one of those conditions, and if you suffer from any of the other associated symptoms, such as chronic pain, muscle spasms, uh, nausea vomiting, or um, wasting or weight loss, then you can qualify. So you typically look for one in each category. And it doesn't have to be active. You can also have a history of it. So um, it might be an intermittent symptom. So for instance, if you have a diagnosis of cancer, um, and currently at this moment, you might not have nausea vomiting, but you might have had it in the past, or you might anticipate developing that symptom as you go through chemotherapy, that's not an issue. Great. Thank you, Evelyn, for that question. Let's see. Well, I'm checking. I don't see any other more questions um, from the group. Um, I think we can probably go ahead and wrap up. Um, if anybody's got a last burning question, feel free to quickly put it in the chat. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you so much, Dr. Parikh, for this wonderful talk. Um, it was very informative. And thank you all of us for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Have a good night, everyone. All right, take care. Bye. Bye.